Good morning. morning. And welcome to Good Shepherd. Uh, We'll be following the order of worship as you find it printed here in your worship folder. Uh, The reason I have the cards up here is because it helped to remind me last week when I had the dice up here. Uh, In case you missed last week, we used dice in our Bible class. It just worked out really well. And uh, today we are using cards. And we have enough cards for all the tables. Um, so, and it's not a card game like you've ever played before, I'm pretty certain, pretty certain. And this is just to remind me, to remind you afterwards that uh, we have a, a three-question Bible class on the uh, Beatitudes. With that in mind, I want to draw your attention to some things in the worship folder. Uh, I got an email from uh, Dave Bruja, he's our choir director, excellent choir director, by the way. I, I never have said this enough, but you need to know as a pastor, I never have to worry a thing about choir because he looks first of all at the words and then he looks at the music. That's just, you know, uh, so it's right on uh, every time. And uh, they're going to be replacing the hymn that is printed for us here in our worship folder. So they'll be singing the first hymn. And then I want to make you aware of that insert with those words. That's the first hymn that we'll be singing during the distribution of the Lord's Supper. So with those in mind, now let's take a deep breath and focus our minds and our hearts on our Savior who rescued us, and we have life guaranteed forever. Uh, Good health, endless joy, uh, angels all around us, and we've gathered to worship Him. Please give your attention to our choir. Thank you. 
We continue now in our worship folder on page two. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God is faithful. God gave us his word. God keeps his word. God has gathered us to worship in the same way that we live from day to day. In the name of the only God and our Savior. Heavenly Father, we do not keep our word. We are unfaithful and rebel against you with our thoughts, words, and activities. We do not deserve one single blessing from your hand. Yet in Jesus' name, we come and ask you to please forgive us. Turn us back to yourself and have mercy on us. Upon this, your sincere confession, I tell you God's good news. God forgives you. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you have been set free. Go in peace and sin no more.
Almighty God, in your bountiful goodness, keep us safe from every evil of body and soul. Make us ready with cheerful hearts to do whatever pleases you. We ask in joyful confidence through Jesus Christ. He lives and rules with you and the Father, one God, now and forever. Our first Bible reading is, uh, well, actually, we just sang it from Psalm 27. Uh, that's that psalm that uh, we just sang, we are singing. Uh, the next one, the reading one, Habakkuk, is the one that the sermon is based on, so I'm going to wait until the sermon time so it's still fresher in our memories. So now I'll go right to the second Bible reading from Luke chapter 17. Jesus said to his disciples, Offenses will certainly come, but woe to the one they come through. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than for him to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and comes back to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, the Lord said, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Which one of you, having a slave tending sheep or plowing, will say to him when he comes in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? <laughs> Instead, will he not tell him, Prepare something for me to eat. Get ready and serve me while I eat and drink. Later, you can eat and drink. Does he thank that slave because the slave did what was commanded? In the same way, when you have done all that you were commanded, you should say, we are good-for-nothing slaves. We've only done our duty. Here ends our reading. Our next reading is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, in case you want to know where this is in the Apostle Paul's timeline of his life, he's on death row. Uh, he's pretty much convinced this is the last opportunity he's going to be able to get a message out, and the Lord gives him these words so that he can uh, encourage young Pastor Timothy. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience as my ancestors did when I constantly remember you in my prayers, night and day, remembering your tears. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy, clearly recalling your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois, then in your mother Eunice, and that I am convinced is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to keep ablaze the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fearfulness, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. So, don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. This has now been made evident through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel, I was appointed a herald, apostle, and teacher. And that's why I suffer these things. But I am not ashamed, because I know the one I have believed in, and am persuaded that he is able to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day. Hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who lives in us that good thing entrusted to you. Here ends our reading. We now join in singing in the song of the day, O for a faith that
that will not shrink. Number 405 in our Red Song books. rejoice and be glad in it. God's word for our meditation is taken from Habakkuk. Pretty sure it's been a while since you and I have read Habakkuk. Habakkuk is uh, not a really long book. Isaiah is a long book. Habakkuk is a very short couple of chapters. And in these, in this book of Habakkuk, it's kind of interesting all the prophets of the Old Testament, we always think of them as guys who are like in-your-face kind of guys. They were sent out by God because they had to stop his people from walking over the edge of the cliff and dying. And so they would get right in their face and they'd say, hey, hey, stop, stop, stop. And they yell in their ears and they do all this stuff. Then along comes Habakkuk, and he lived at the same time as Jeremiah. And his book is tucked in between Nahum and Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. He's right in there. And he does not do that. Instead, he has a really neat habit that is going to wind up helping us quite a bit. From Habakkuk chapter 1. The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received... How long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen or cry out to you, vent violence, but, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife. Conflict abounds. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts I will look to see what the Lord will say to me, what answer I am to give to this complaint. Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that whoever reads it may run with it, for the revelation waits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though he linger, wait for him. He will certainly come and will not delay. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by his faith. 
May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our defender. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, my dear friends and fellow believers, the last couple of weeks we looked at 1 Timothy. Today you heard a reading, 2 Timothy. Little things that go on in a pastor's life, just so I'll let you know, we get letters. Some of the letters are just letters of, of great thanks that God has done something magnificent and they just have to share with someone and they know that other people might take it wrong, so they're just sharing with somebody that their pastor, they can trust their pastor. And then you get the handful of complaint letters, you know, it's too hot or too cold or too bright or too dark, you know, those kinds of things. And you try and ascertain as a pastor, how is this disturbing their worship? And then you get letters, somewhat like this letter. A young business executive wrote this. <clears throat> Dear pastor, I see so many people around the church who have such a strong faith. I don't feel like I fit in. I'd like to feel confident. I wish I did not have doubts, but... To be honest, I've got more questions than answers. Sometimes I wonder if I really am a Christian. I have so many questions. Can you help me with any of this? Could you have written that letter? I'm telling you, there was a time in my life when I could have definitely written that letter. Several volumes of that letter. God is not afraid of questions. Just because you and I have been gifted by God with faith doesn't mean we struggle with questions. If you just look at this book of Habakkuk, that's what he does. He carries these questions that are on the people's minds to God. And he's kind of blunt about it. And then he stands there and he waits for God to answer, and God answers. He answers the questions. And that's a great habit that he shows us how to, how to live through those times in life when we are just peppered with questions. He carries the complaints to God, and then he quiets himself as he's waiting for God to give him an answer. Starts off like this. Remember that first troubling question? How long, O oh Lord? How long? That's the question that every kid has sitting in the back seat when you just start off on vacation. Are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. How long? You're fighting a disease. How long, Lord, till I get some kind of respite from this disease? You're fighting long-term pain. How long, oh Lord, before the pain gets a little bit less? You're fighting a heartbreak because of terrible things going on in your family. How long, oh Lord? The second question is as troubling. No, I think the second question is even more troubling. Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Not just how long, but how come? Lord, why aren't you doing anything? On school campuses... Your children are mocked because they believe in Jesus Christ. They do not get good grades if they stand up for the truth of what God says in his word. They are constantly, with their peers, kind of looked funny at because, you know, they're Christian. They live different, you know, those Christian kids. They don't go out and get drunk. They don't do those drugs things. They don't, they don't like to, to do mean things at school. You know, they're just kind of weird. Not only that, if you looked at all the violence going around, the violence, oh, there's lots of violence. There's violence in the same thing, same place where this word was first given in Habakkuk's time in the Middle East, there is still violence. My entire adult life, there's just been violence there, one thing after another. Then, of course, we have our own homebound terror that goes on here in our country. And I'm sure as you're watching online, you're thinking about a dozen other different places 
where there could be terrible things going on. Then you add to that the tsunamis and the hurricanes and the volcanoes and the earthquakes and the tornadoes. Why, oh Lord, do you let all this bad stuff happen? This is a question that comes and attacks our children. Why does God allow children to suffer at the hands of predators? Why do families suffer one tragedy after another? Since your God is just, why does hate mock the song of God's peace proclaimed on earth and we don't got no peace? Those are deadly questions. If you're not aware of those questions, then you're not aware of the attacks that our children are going through on school campuses. So sharpen up your prayer life and pray for them. Let the Lord defend their faith. And this book of Habakkuk has a really cool way to do that. He has a habit. He listens to the questions that are all swirling around him. He takes his own questions from his own heart and he carries them to the Lord. And he says, Lord... How long? Lord, why? And then he quiets himself on the watchtower and he waits for the Lord. He waits for God to answer. That is a really good habit. The habit is that he takes the stuff to God and then he quiets himself. Now, as soon as you say, be quiet, you know, I can just hear you shaking your head. Oh, yeah, like that's going to happen, Pastor. When you walk into church, there's constant noise, there's constant talking, there's music, there's things going on all the time. We get up in the morning, we turn on the radio or the TV. You go to the car, you turn on the radio or the TV. What do you mean, quiet yourself? <laughs> Is there such thing as quiet? People have to have noise on when they wake up, noise on when they go to sleep, noise on during the day. Even when they go on their walks in the countryside, they have the earphones on and they're listening to something because we can't stand quiet. But that is not the kind of quiet that's going on. Habakkuk quieted himself. He took everything to God and he says, you know, God, this is the questions swirling around in my heart and the hearts of the people that I'm serving here. How long... And why? How long and how come? And then he does what we are to do. He just, on the inside, quiets himself and he waits. It's hard to wait on God, but he waits for God to answer. And God does answer. Later on in the book of Habakkuk, we're told the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. God knows. He wants us to know that he knows. And then while we're quiet, it's very easy to do a wonderful thing, to keep on praying to God, to do Habakkuk's habit, and to pray for others. To put yourself spiritually into the shoes and the sandals and the moccasins and the slippers and the boots of other people. So you're not consumed with what's going on in your own life, you're consumed with what's going on in the lives of others. To pray for help for them in their time of trouble, to pray for wisdom so they know exactly how the, to do the best thing for giving God glory. You pray for God to continually direct them. And while you're praying for them, don't forget to pray for our congregation as well. Pray that God continually direct us and guide us and keep us close to himself and his word, being faithful. You know, somebody wrote this, it's not original with me. They said, so on I go not knowing, I would not if I might, I would rather walk in the dark with God than walk alone at night. I'd rather walk with God by faith than walk alone by sight. Habakkuk's habit was pretty simple. He would take these questions, he would carry them to God, he would quiet himself. Cool thing is, is that 
what God was doing. God was carrying Habakkuk into the throne room of his heavenly father. And while he was there in the throne room of his heavenly father, he quieted down his child so his child could speak to him one-on-one and let him know really what's bothering him, knowing he had the full attention of the God of gods. So God carried Habakkuk into his presence. God moved Habakkuk and gave him the courage to let God know what was going on. God quieted him down while he answered him. In Habakkuk's case, Habakkuk never knew that all the stuff that he needed, that God was the only thing that he needed until that's all he had was God. You and I, the same way, we will never know that God is all we need until God is all we have. And when we have God, that is plenty. More than enough for day to day and a guarantee of eternal life. Like the Apostle Paul said, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus did in our place, lived in our place, died in our place, came back to life in our place. We hear that so often, it's got a hit right down here. Our Lord Jesus gave up his life so that you and I would know that he carries us into God's presence, he calms us down, and he gives us an answer. He's all that we need. Keep trusting in him, in his name. So let us live. Amen. And now may God's peace, which goes beyond all human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And now pause for the gathering of our offerings. Father, again, we thank you for the great privilege and honor of coming together to worship you. You're the God who saved us. Then you made us aware of this. Then you made sure that it was written down so that we could teach our children that wonderful truth. Oh, Lord, when the questions come to us, please remind us once again of your great promises and use these offerings that we give to you now, not only as our way of saying thank you to you, but our way of asking you to multiply them And join them with other gifts so that your word may spread far and wide. And we ask this, Jesus, for the glory of your name. Amen. And our prayers today, our prayers have been requested for Gloria in New York. Uh, She is uh, still uh, recovering, uh, but uh, thankfully she's had a a little bit of a respite from all of the pain that she's been having recently as she is in rehab. 
we're going to be using as a basis for our prayers, a prayer originally written by a Christian by the name of John Jewell, and he wrote this prayer around the year 1567. For those of you who don't know, the reason why I do this, this is a time in Lutheran liturgy where it's called the general prayer. And when I was growing up, I used to think, well, general prayer, that means this, everything goes up there, and it's a general thing of talking to God. No, the general prayer is a way so that you and I can remember the past, the Christians who have gone before us, pray for the things that we see going on right now, and look ahead to the future when Jesus comes back for us. And that's why it comes after the Bible readings and the sermon, and before we receive the Lord's Supper, which provides the strength to live on those days that are coming. So now let's use the words of John Jewell, shall we? Let's rise and go to our Lord in prayer. O most merciful Father, we beseech you for your mercy's sake, continue your grace and favor towards us. Please do not let the sun of your gospel ever go down out of our hearts. Let your truth abide and be established among us forever. Help our unbelief and increase our faith. Give us hearts to consider that this is our time, the time of grace that you give us to come to faith and to stay in faith and to guard that faith. Through faith, clothe us with Jesus Christ, that he may always live on us and that your name may be glorified through us in all the world. Jesus, we also ask that you please continue your many graces being shown to Gloria in New York. Lord, you are a good and a gracious God. You have been with her all the time, and you've reminded her through your friends and through her fellow believers that she is never alone. You are always by her side. And now you have also given her some respite from that pain and, and suffering that she's been going through. And we thank you together with her for that little respite. We ask that if it is at all possible, that that continue. And Lord, we also ask that you please watch over all of us so that we may stay firm in our faith, stay close to you, never leaving you and never abandoning you. We ask all of these things, Jesus, in your name. And now in your name, we come to our Heavenly Father and we use that perfect prayer that you taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. As is our custom here, we offer our first table to our online members. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, given to death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of your sins. Now may this strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Come, for all things are now ready.
life everlasting. It hearts and peace for your sins are forgiven.
our heads in prayer. Blessed be the Lord. You have done wonderful things, and you have blessed us with your holy name. O Lord, we are not worthy of all your goodnesses and mercies that you have again showered on us. We ask that you please use this holy supper to strengthen our faith, to increase our love both for you and for others, to remain steadfast until you come for us once again. We ask this, Jesus, in your name, for you are the living one. Amen. And now place on you the Lord's own name. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. The parting song is on the back of our worship folder. <laughs>